Time for another adventure. Let's just find somewhere to hide out of the wind. We're out on another Saturday. It is absolutely pissing it down with the rain. It was blowing a gale, so business as usual. It's just gone daylight. It's, I think it's around about, you know, eight o'clock ish in the morning. Half past eight, maybe, at a push. And I've got the two rods and I'm going to put the third rod out now but I think I'm going to have a cup of coffee before I do anything because it's it's been emotional trying to get everything sorted out in the pissing room. And the weather forecast for the day is more rain. Because more rain is good. Where I'm fishing we're between two fields, and there's a ditch between the two fields where I'm parked. The ditch is currently pumping in uh, very cloudy, very brown water. So subsequently, at my feet, it's very stained, it's very dirty, it's very coloured. But about eight feet out into the main system, it's the it's normal clear coloured. That buzzing you can hear, that, has, that noise you can hear is the kettle. Sometimes fishing on the where the dirty water meets the clear water is is very very good because predators use it as an ambush or a position to ambush prey and prey fish use it as a place to hide so it might be okay I, this has been raining for a couple of days now we did have a cold snap in the middle of the week where it went to like minus four so I'm hoping that because I'm fishing the river the river is moving the, the cold snap didn't really have that much effect but we will see. There's a guy in a boat that's about, about 50 yards that way. And I don't know what he's doing. I really don't know what he's doing. He looks to be like fly fishing, but I don't think he's getting the most out of his casts. So. Anyway. Kettle has boiled, that means it is time for a cup of tea, or coffee even, so I'll see you in a minute. A few moments later. Well, it's uh, throwing it down the rain. I'm going to, I got asked this question, you know, different leads for different things. So I'll do, do a quick uh, couple of minutes on different leads for different things. And then I'm going to go through popping up bits, how I do it, because some people see the traces that I use. And they wanted like our detailed rundown. So what I'll do is I'll build one for you and I'll show you the different how how I do it, you know, how the different ways I pop up kids. First let's go to the leads I use. Most leads I use are between three to four ounce. For the normal casting for the bank, three and four ounces is perfect. If I'm just casting somewhere and there's no uh, there's no flow, there's no undercurrent. You just cast it and it's onto a fairly flat bottom. Then you use one of these. This is just a distance lead. You can tell by the shape. Heavy at the arse end with the loop that you attach at the top end. That will fly to the horizon. Very aerodynamic and very, very good. It gives you ample weight to wind down to set your line straight and tight. So that when the pike picks up the bit. And if it mo any movement at all with the bit, because you've got a tight line and you're using this as your anchor point, the drop arm's going to go and you're going to get notified that there's a pike saying hello to whatever bit you're using. So that's a distance lead. Out and out distance, very, very good. If you're fishing somewhere that the bottom kind of slopes and you don't want it, the bit to move, then you can use one of these, which is a flat-sided pair. Again, Casts very well, a lot of weight at the bottom of the, the arse end, and yeah, very good for what you need it to do. Not so good if you're fishing on a river because it'll get pulled along. As you can see, it's flat, so if the bottom is like that there, it, it tends to sit like that. 
and doesn't move. Again, because it's giving you ample weight to get your line tight, then any sort of movement of the bait and the drop arm will go and you'll be striking into hopefully the pike of your dreams. So, pair leads. Now you get square pairs, you get square sided pairs, you, basically any flat sided lead is designed basically not to roll down a slope. That's why it has flat sides. But if you're moving on a river and you want to fish static on a river, you're going to have to use what's called grip leads. I have two that I like here. This is one of them. As you can see by the profile on that, there's aggressive nodules, bumps, that anchor into the bottom and hold the bottom. This will not get pulled along by the current. This sets in this dirt and it's very, very good. These are made by Atomic. I don't even know if you can get them anymore. But I can remember buying three, four and five ounce and I'm pretty much sure I've used all the five ounce leads and I'm only down to some four ounce ones. But again, very, very good on moving water. You use stuff like this, your lead's going to anchor to the bottom, it's not going to move. But say you're fishing somewhere where there's a little bit more flow. It's moving a little bit faster and you really, really don't want your bait to move. The best ones I've found, and I hate to drop names, is the Nash ones, the tractor ones. There's something about the little, the little teeth in them that really manage to anchor in. It's a smaller profile lead than the atomic one. It's, there's not a big hole in the middle of it. I don't know why it seems to hold better, but these leads tend to hold better on the bottom. Now where we're fishing today, we're on a river, the river is moving. I've initially put out just normal distance torpedo leads. Uh, they're four ounces and the river isn't pushing through heavy enough that, that it will move these leads. So I'm quite happy leaving those leads on. Just because you're fishing a river doesn't mean you have to go and buy specialist, you know, leads like this to anchor into the bottom. But if you have them, it helps. I have a lead bag in my van that's got, you know, all the leads that I would ever need, you know, for a session. It lives in the van. If I'm going away fishing and I'm walking from the van, I'll put, you know, five or six four ounce leads in my bag. And if I use the five or six four ounce leads, then I've had a bad day. But you don't want to be carrying too much because it is lead and it is heavy. And you don't want to add more weight to your back when you're trying to go across a field of rubbish. So, leads. Sounds simple. I just had to go through it. It's really cold. The wind is kind of pushing the rain and it is all heading this direction. So when you're out there, it's it's cold. <laughs> it's cold. But we'll just have to man up and get through it. Now we'll talk about how to pop up your bait. You have two ways realistically of doing this. One, you can inject air into a bit. I don't use this method because I don't think it works well enough. You can insert stuff like uh, balsa wood with a little eye into the bit. Now these come in different sizes. I mean, you have, you know, small, medium and large there. Back in the day when I first started pike fishing, I can remember reading an article where people were getting just polystyrene from packing from like polystyrene and they're breaking a pair, breaking the lump off of forceps and pushing that into the bait to make the bait buoyant. Did it work? Yes, the bait was very buoyant. However, would I recommend that? No. You have to think if you're putting this into a bait, then you have to be able to secure this to your trace so you're getting it back. Why do you want it back? Well, simple way is you eat it. A normal person, eat that. And see how much fun that is to pass that. You will struggle. The pike will do the same. So if you just put these into the bait and you don't secure them, the pike will eat the bait. The bait will go to the pike's stomach. The stomach will dissolve the acids. The acid, stomach acids will dissolve the bait, dissolve the bones, all the stuff it's normally supposed to do. But then it's left with a big hunk of balsa wood to try and pass through its gut. 
and that doesn't really work so well because stomach acids don't really dissolve wood so you end up it's not good for the fish so those are internal how you pop up the bait from the inside then we have external things like these these are pop-up balls this is on a truss that I connect to my main bait truss I will pull this through the bait with a bit needle and that sits at, sits at the bait and pops the bait up I'm going to show you how I make the bait truss so uh, let's get on to that shall we right so how do you make a pop-up truss well let's start with the wire I use 45 pound AFW bleeding leader I quite like bleeding leader I quite like American fishing wire it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody I'm not sponsored by anybody I get all my wire from Eddie Turner's place has links in the, the, the description below start off by putting a crimp on then you're going to use your treble hooks Make a kink at the end of the wire. Pinch the eye of the treble with your thumb and forefinger. Wrap this tag end around the wire so that it looks like this. Then take this bit and put it back through the eye. So it looks like this. Then you fold it over the So that's what you want so far. Then you're going to take this tag end and put it through this loop. So take tag end. Put it through a loop. It's a little bit fiddly. Take your time. So there you go that's the basis of what's called what I call a choke knot because you can pull this as tight as you want and all that wire will do is strangle itself or choke itself it's not going to get loose it's just going to bind down tighter so then we take our crimping pliers slide the crimp back down You can pull it tight at this point, in fact do pull it tight. These are little knot puller things. I did have a really good aluminium one that was like all aluminium. It was brilliant but I lost it. So you know, hold it like that, your fingers. I grab the I grab the tag end with the, the crimping pliers a little bit. I give it a good pull. Again hold the, hold the finger down. I give that end a good pull. And as you can see, it is tight. It's not going to go anywhere. You then, as a matter of the extra extra security, you crimp it. So there you have your treble secured to your wire. This is the most secure way I have found of making a trace. For fun, I made a load of traces up, uh, thinking different methods. I made them with twisting, I made them just wrapping it around through the eye once, and then crimping it. And then I hung them up in the garage, and I hung bricks off them. And I very quickly found out that the traces weren't going to fall apart by bricks. So I went to my friend who's a, who's a rather into his gym, bit of a gym fanatic this lad. I went to him and borrowed some cattle bells or kettle bells kettle bells cattle bells whatever they're called oh before I go anywhere but my pop-up traces I want them to be about two foot long so I pull uh, two foot 24 inches so I pull about 
27 inches of, of wire off the spool. Why 27 inches? Well, that there is an inch that wrapped around the hook is an inch. So that means that you've just brung it down to 26 inches. Wrapping it around the second hook is another inch. Brings it down to 25 inches. And then wrapping it around for the final time at the top end brings it down to 24 inches. It doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't have to be, you know, per the millimetre. It just has to be long enough so that it pops up off the bottom and it gives it a good depth. Now I'm sliding on a little silicone sleeve, crimp cover, sleeve cover, whatever you want to call it. There you go. Now let's put on the second treble. Take your treble, take your wire, put the wire through the eye, slide it down. So there we go, Gus. Make it the distance that you want. I'm going to go for about that distance. And we're going to use the, uh, a knotless knot. So again, pinch the wire, fold the wire back, wrap it around five times. Put your finger on it to hold it there. And there you go. That's it on via a knotless knot. Now, knotless knots are another type of uh, choke knot. No matter how much you pull, that's just going to tighten itself down. Now, 45 pound wire, there's no pike that swims in. I'd be happily wager there's no pike that swims anywhere that's going to bite off 45 pound wire. And there you go. That's the basis. Now if I wanted to I could just put a, a swivel on this end and that would be your normal truss. But we're making a pop-up truss. So let's put this to the side for a second. And let's get some extra bits and pieces. you want one of these it's a little small clip and you want one of these it's a little small split ring this it's a bit strange you're just gonna have to go with me this is how I do it I suppose you could do it where you don't need the split ring but this is what I do so if you want to do it like I do this is what you need you can pick these up off eBay for like a couple of quid for a pack of like 50 they're next to nothing we then take some of our old truss, because I had to butcher this, this truss was dead anyway, so this is why we're using trebles that aren't shiny, bright and new, and this is like the, the body of the old truss. So what we're going to do, in fact I'm not going to use that because that was a £60 truss, not a £45 truss, so we're going to use this here, that was another £60 truss, in fact I fuck it, we'll use this. So you're going to take off about that much, but an inch. You're going to fold it in half so that it looks like this. You're then going to get a crimp. Now, for this, I use crimps that aren't uh, terribly strong. They're kind of what I would, I wouldn't class them as garbage, but I wouldn't use them to hold anything for that way. They were for sea angling, for crimping mono. So I'll slide that down to where I want it to go. I'll get my little clip. I'll slide it onto the, like that. And I'm going to push these two through the truss. If 
before I crimp it, I'm going to show it just like that there. It's important to note that this isn't isn't holding anything. All that's going to hold, it isn't holding anything that's going to be like of danger. It isn't like nothing relies on this. This is weak, so if it gets snagged up, it can pull out. All this crimp will do is just pinch it in place in the wire. Again, you don't want to squeeze too hard. You just want to pinch it in place. So you're putting it about there. And you're just giving it a little squeeze. You're not trying to squeeze the fucking the gubbins out of it. You just want to give it a little squeeze. So that's it crimped into place now. Now then take your rubber sleeve. Slide it down the line. And it covers... There you go. Just makes it tidier, and it you can push this rubber sleeve down, and it secures this, so the, the little pop up's not going to go anywhere. Now we do the swivel. Take your rubber sleeve, thread it on. Take your crimp. Use your good crimps, not your crap ones. Thread it on, get your swivel. I suggest doing all this at home because doing it on the bank is fiddly as hell. I'm just going to whip through this and get this done. I tend to make all my traces up at home. It annoys the hell out of my wife. <laughs> I don't know why. It just seems to annoy her. My wife isn't a fan of having me having fishing kit in the house. But if I'm being honest, if anyone should understand, my wife should understand. She grew up in a house where her father was an angler, her brother was an angler. So she grew up in a house where there was fishing tackle always, always on display. Not that it's a bad thing, she just, she's just house proud. Now, before anyone starts, I'm not flinging the, the tag ends into the back here. There's a plastic bag here, I have full of rubbish. So. There we go. Swivel. Trace. How to make a pop-up trace. How the pop-up trace did I use? It's been a bit long-winded, but bear with me, we're nearly at the end. So now how do we pop up a bit? Well. Let me show you. Take your trace, put it over here out of the road. Take your bit. On this occasion, the smelt that I'm using, the head fell off. So we're going to use this as a pop-up bit. Take your baiting needle. Thread your baiting needle through the bit. Like so. See when it's frozen? I like to do this when it's frozen so that it makes a like a track that you can use. Then you take your link. All this is is a link of wire with two crimps and two loops at the end. That's all it is. There's nothing special about it. You're going to pull that through the bit. Pull the little gate down. Pull it through the bit to there. And then you're going to attach a pop-up to it. 
Now, you could use a normal pop-up ball, foam ball. But on this occasion, I'm going to use one of my fluorescent foam pop-up things. These are designed for catfish anglers. They're halibut smelling. I don't think it makes a difference that they smell of halibut. The smelt won't say, oh god, I smell of halibut. The pike won't stop and go, oh shit, this smelt smells of halibut. I think I better not eat it. It's just one of those things. Take your little boilie stop. Set it down there. Thread on your... In this case we're going to call it a popper. Take boiler stop, put boiler stop in trace, like so, pull tight, like so, there we go. So that bit now should be popped up, so let's get our trace. In fact, this one's a bit longer, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shorten it. So, it's not a problem. We pull it tight to the bit. We just take our scissors, cut that off, put that in the bin, take our rubbish crimps. clip, slide the rubber over the and there you have it, a popped up smelt ready to rock and roll, the rubber is pushed down so it can't, the little lead, can't, the little link can't pop off and that'll just sit Nice and proud, out the top of the water, with the best pop up like that there, and let's see if it works shall we, let's go and cast it out right now. Right, so let's see if our pop up pops up. Clipped on, standard fishing way, standard way I fish. Oh, it's just not buoyant enough. Either way, it'll sit like that there. I should have put an extra pop-up ball on it. But, it isn't entirely awful. No, it's not all bad. Let's get, let's put it out, shall we? And we're going to put it out. There's a bush straight in front of me. So I'm going to put it out towards the bush. And we're on the bottom. And there's the line going now, pointing towards the bush with the flow. There we go. I might have to use a grip lead. Uh, 
I might have to use a grip lid. So there we have it, popped up, smelt, big roach hybrid, and I'm going to change this one for a eel. I quite like eels here, eels are one of my favourite bits on the urn. <laughs> Today is not a blank, tangled up and pulled in some match angler's feeder. Uh, it looks fairly fresh and on the end was a hybrid so today hasn't been a blank I have released the hybrid back into the river yes I have released it it's not attached to any hooks another exciting episode of cooking with scobes but we've just had a bit of a tinkle so excuse me I'll take a look Nope, it is just current. Oh, just the current. Right. Today, we are cooking in a frying pan. Believe it or not, this frying pan was like £12 off eBay. It doesn't have any fancy names on it, so it's so it's, oh, it's all good. If it had like a fancy name like Fox or Corda or you know some other fancy name, it would probably cost a lot more money. But because it just has generic Japanese name, result a bargain. Update! Haha, <laughs> I caught a, I caught something, or rather somebody else caught something and then broke off and I've ended up catching somebody's hybrid. Three rods out. Popped up, smelt, a funky mackerel and a big hybrid. And I'm just going to enjoy a bacon sandwich. Today I'm having Denny's finest maple cured thick bacon. And I'm going to enjoy it, I'm going to treat myself I'm going to have some brioche buns because if you don't spoil yourself, no one else will <sighs> still raining still blowing a gale but who cares, I've got a bacon sandwich on the go Lots of rubbish coming down the river. Take off smelt. Okay, don't know what I've done to that hook. Pull it back in. There we go. Quick demo before I get soaked about how I prepare my mackerel. Take tail, take tail off. Don't need tail, spins in the water, no good. Take head, push through head, twist a little bit. That wound there will let all the juice from the mackerel head out. Take trace, push through mackerel. And 
that is how I prepare my mackerel. These are the haggis flavoured ones. So far, out of a packet of four, I have been unimpressed. So let's see if today's, if this one changes my mind on them. Right, popped up smelt, haggis red mackerel, big hybrid. Let's see what today shall we, let's see what we bring in today. Let's go. One eternity later. Looks like we've got to run. Yes, we're in. This is on the the big stinky mackerel. Doesn't feel a bad fish. Sit here now, son. There we go. Ah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Looks all right, I guess. Right, let's get this unhooked. Oop, shit. That looks all right. Maybe, maybe ten pound if we're lucky. Let's get it unhooked. Bad enough. Looks healthy enough. And you can see where she's just hooked there. So I'm going to go on through the gills here. Come on, baby. Calm down. Calm down. Right. Run through the gills. We're going to. On her glass, but and we're 
go now. Pick up the so come on you fucker. And then we're going to put it into the unhooking mat or the retaining sling just to get the sails sorted out. In the side. It's just that's gonna be not here just. Sixteen pound, six ounces. What a lovely fish! Beautiful, fat, healthy river fish. Let's get her put back in now. Sixteen pound, six ounces. Lovely river, Urn Pike. It just needs to swim out of the. There she goes. Beautiful. Up there, time. Just had another dropped run. It didn't feel like a. It didn't feel anywhere near as heavy as the last fish. It just kind of... Oh, it was on for about 20 seconds and then popped off. So I don't know. The weather has dried out a little bit. But every now and then we get this almighty gust of wind and then it just starts to hammer it down the rain again. So Still got three rods out. On this, the very very end one, it's a popped up smelt. Middle one is the uh, the haggis flavoured mackerel. And the other one I've just swapped, the other one that did have the big hybrid, I've swapped it out for a perch. Just fancied a bit of a change, so I swapped out the perch. And again, that's fishing exactly where the big hybrid was fishing. So, it is what it is. Times of it's three o'clock. Start to pack up about half four. Slow pack up, and then take a, a drive down the road. But it hasn't been so bad. Not blanked. That fish was a nice, healthy, chunky fish. So a few more of them wouldn't go amiss. This place has been used tomorrow by the match guys. The match guys were on this place last weekend and I know that they did they did better at this end of the river than they did at the other end of the river down towards the marina. So there's still silverfish, shoalfish here so this is where the pike are here. If you go up the river that way you come to an island at the the end of the island there's like a little blip and there's like a little other smaller island and just after that there's a drop off or it drops into a big deep hole I'm trying to get access to the farmland to speak to the farmer that owns the land 
so I can get down there and fish there, but we'll see, we'll see. You might have to go and bribe him with alcohol, give him a bottle of bush mills or something. But apart from that, today's been okay, apart from the weather. In that wind, it's, it's not nice, it's cold. But that's fishing in the winter in Northern Ireland for pike. <laughs> in other news, I've remembered another bit about leads. We talked earlier in the video about leads. And I neglected to tell you these about these things here. These are back leads. See this place in the summertime. Or if it's like a really nice warm autumn day, you're gonna have, you're gonna be tortured by boats, and the boats cut in very very close to where you're fishing, so you have to kind of sink your either sink your rod tips, which is hard off a jetty, or you have to put back leads in. These are little back leads from Fox. They weigh forty five grams, forty three grams, and the reason I like them is because you just you just clip the line through them like that. And then just slide them down, so your line's going to go from your rod tip to the, the run ring, and then out. It's dangerous to use it on the bottom if there's zebra mussels. But, you know, you have a choice. Do I get snagged up by a boat going past and catching my line? Or do I sink the line and then get snagged up on a zebra mussel? Or do I find somewhere else to fish? So you all have to weigh these things up in your own head. I know what the feet where the jetty is here. It's all silt and it's dirt and it's muck. So the problem with using these that they might sink into the muck and the dirt and then your line might have resistance going through it. So I don't know if these are going to be if they could use them here. If it was hard clay you could use them because they would just sit in the bottom like that and your line would run through them. But I don't know if they would work with the soft silt. That and there's that much stuff coming down that little stream. There's a lot of weed and dirt and crap coming down it. Uh, that little stream's been pumping hard all day. It's basically the drains for these fields all run into it. So it's it's dumping a ton of coloured water into the system. And you can like you can see the, the margins very, very coloured, very, very dirty. And past the margin it's normal normal water. But it's uh one more thing to try every day being a school day and all of that sort of stuff uh, I think I might have another cup of tea or coffee yeah first outing for my new my new frying pan after my uh, my incident with the ridge monkey and I'm actually Kind of impressed with it. It's a little frying pan. It does the job. You can fit three bits of bacon in it. You could probably get maybe four or five sausages in it. Handle folds down. It's lightweight. Comes with its own little mesh bag. And it was, you know, next to nothing off eBay. It also has the handles that look surprisingly like the Fox cookware. That's a lot more expensive than what I paid for this. This doesn't have any brand name on it. It's just unbranded. Come from China. It's just a little frying pan. It has replaced my uh, tippy monkey. But that's more so for longer. So this is going to be more so used for like cooking up a bacon sandwich, or when I'm longer night when I'm fishing overnight, maybe cooking something else. I suppose you can get a couple of pork chops on that. Yeah. A couple of pork chops, tin of chili con carne, and there you go. Dinner in a pan. <laughs> Before the end of this winter, I will be out on the bank with... Uh... There's this wind again. I will get back out in the bank with little Jake. We're just sorting out his licenses and we're still waiting for the stuff to come from Glasgow Anglin. So I know a few of you have been asking for him. He's doing good. He's still wanting to go fishing. I'm also going to be doing a, a collaboration with 
with uh, the, the Northern Island Carper, Darrell. That'll probably happen in February. But February is shaping up to be a busy month. February is kind of good. The pike began, the pike really began to go on the feed through the February, March time to spawn in April. I'm trying to get access, like I say, to a part of a part of a farm up here, and I'm trying to get access to some estate like places that are closer to me. But we'll see how it goes. At the minute, I'm still fishing public water, as you know. This is sorry, public water. This is the urn. Anyone can fish it. So you know, anyone can come down and fish it. But it would be nice to get somewhere where I can fish and not have to worry about anyone coming down and fishing it. This is why I'm at trying to find get trying to get on permission to the farmer's land so I can get down and you know I'll, I'll probably have to clear myself a swim because it's reeded. So I'll probably have to get oh. No, it's, it's just the wind, I guess. Just the wind. Oh. Anyway, cup of tea time. It's just gone 20 to 5. I think I'm going to pack up. So all that's left is the rods and the rod pod. Looking at the weather forecast, the weather forecast is telling me that I've got about three quarters of an hour of dryish weather before it starts to batter it down again. So I think get while the getting is good. Pack up now and then go home. I'd have uh, a takeaway and a beer with MSW. That sounds a plan. It's not been a bad day, it's been productive. It's good to get out. One pike on the bank and a hybrid, if you can count that. Although I didn't really catch that. I just snagged somebody else's line that had caught that. Oh well. Two dropped runs, one fish on the bank. And it was a double. So hey, that's not so bad. I can't really argue with that. I'm doing all right today. Until the next time trips, see you later.